Welcome to our second day of the Open Business Council Summit. And uh, to everyone listening to us all over the world, I want to welcome everyone. We had the first day of a huge success in terms of numbers and in terms of, uh, first of all, the quality of our sessions, panels, and with around 50 people joining us in terms of our sessions, panelists, speakers, CEOs, and leading personalities and governments. Um, and we are here today to continue with the second day full of uh, a wealth of panelists, wealth of sessions that will be highlighting the different trends, the different things that we are facing today when it comes to governments, business, digital transformation, and the challenge with COVID-19 and how to deal with the, this in a way that can create empowerment, digital capacity for making better empowerment of society and as well create more opportunities and that can actually coordinate with the challenge that we are facing nowadays. We're going to be starting in around 13 minutes with a session, a special fireside between Eric van der Cleef, co-founder of Adam.com Base, uh, AdamBase.com and creator of Level 39 and former advisor to the British government in terms of the creation of uh, Tech City that became London Tech City, that became Tech Nation UK, and as well the, the creator of Level 39 and the first CEO, and the right now in a, in a new uh, venture that is looking at precisely how to look at the best things of technology and empower society. And during this fire, fire side, we're going to have now Kazu Takemoto, uh, the Honorable Minister of State and Science and Technology and Policy for Japan, and Kato Ochi, Special Advisor to the Government of Japan, and as well a, a strategist that has been working in technology in a lot of different areas. And then we have as well as a special guest, Tina Jabin, and Managing Director, CEO of Startup Bangladesh, part of the ICT Government Minister. Then we have a panel, the Global Government, Business and Startup Tech Landscape Post-COVID Challenge and Opportunities. They will be moderated by me with the, the Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation for Ukraine. We have as well uh, Tran Van Tang joining us via, via uh, a record pre-record video. That is the Minister of Science and Technology Deputy for Vietnam. And uh, Kumi Duan uh, Kimiko, as she's known, that is responsible for the Vietnam Digital Transformation Frontier Tech Organization that works with the Minister representing Vietnam. Luisa Rubio Arribas, head of Waira X, part of the Telefonica group, and of course, Tina, that will be joining as well this panel. We have afterwards our Ken Frontier Tech, Blockchain, AI, FinTech, Change Our Government, Cities and Society, another very interesting panel uh, moderated by Javed Katak. And then we have Ecosystem Digitization, um, Decentralized Digital Assets, DeFi, Blockchain and Crypto, which is a very a uh, solid topic for our days. And we continue with six more panels during the day that you can see in openbusinesscouncil.org slash summit. And you can see just the agenda with all the panelists, the speakers, the bios, and so forth. So I'm excited to have everyone joining us from different parts around the world, different time zones. We have people from, from Japan, where it's already afternoon, people from Bangladesh, people from uh, uh, India, um, and all Southeast Asia. We have as well a team in Kuala Lumpur and Vietnam. And we have, of course, people joining us a bit later in the afternoon from uh, the Americas and, of course, from Europe, where it's right now morning. So this summit was created the, with the focus of looking at a lot of things that, is, that are happening nowadays, especially the areas of the fourth industrial revolution and the Society 5.0. And how can we tackle these problems that are becoming the biggest problems and probably a frontier technology challenge for humanity? But as well, this all happens during one of the most challenging years, 2020, that uh, precisely 100 years from the last biggest pandemic that was in 1920 has been disrupting the entire world and as well has been creating a serious challenge for governments, for business, creating a huge financial economic havoc, but as well um, making us all change the way we interact with, with each other, with social distance, with a lot of challenge on these areas. 
but this all happens at the same time that we can actually share our ideas, our enthusiasm, and as well our challenge via digital tools. These digital tools are becoming more powerful than ever, and especially frontier technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and the Internet of Things, and the, a lot of other technologies, especially fintech, are changing everything we do and the way we behave as humans. So we're going to be reflecting this, and I welcome everyone around the world to join us. We are streaming on YouTube channel of the Dinish Guarda Cities ABC Open Business Council. We are as well streaming special this session um, in the YouTube channel of the startup Bangladesh Limited. And we are as well um, on Facebook, on Twitter, Open Business HQ and Cities ABC underscore, and with a lot of other people around the world that are joining us and collaborating. So a couple of notes that I want to highlight, and especially probably uh, presenting Eric van der Cleef that is going to make uh, the honors of starting the first fireside panel. One of the things that we are excited is to make sure that part of this summit can actually help us coping better with all the challenges that we're facing, but as well connecting people with different experiences, often a uh, source of knowledge, and as well people that are struggling, but as well trying to create a more positive emphasis to all the challenges that we are facing. We are definitely in a very big, um, I would say, crossroad that is uh, changing the entire society and creating a lot of challenges. And I think the way we tackle this precisely this year and in the next three to five years is going to be critical because we are facing definitely a huge challenge when it comes to everything that is happening in terms of uh, the way we deal with each other, but especially the way we are dealing increasingly with our tools, with our technology, new tools. And I think the most important thing for me as a technologist, as an author, and as well someone that takes these things serious, and as well being teaching for the last 10, 15 years, is how can we make sure that our young generation, our business, our startups, and our governments all work together on this? We cannot divide more society. And this is a great opportunity to make this happen. And as well, with all the challenges come a lot of opportunities. And I think. Um, the way we deal with this now will make a big difference. Artificial intelligence, even in, in, in its inception, has created already a lot of changes in society, especially if you look what happened in US elections, what happened actually in Brexit here in the UK, where I'm based, that has been dividing society and creating a lot of challenges, but as well has been creating unique opportunities for us to share our ideas together and create new paths to improve and to optimize our um, business, our society, and everything related. And today we're going to be talking precisely about this. We have var a variety of panels that will be tackling this, and we have some of the global leading experts like we had yesterday, and everyone can see these panels as well because they will be recorded after and will be posted online. So one of the things that probably in some of the notes that we had yesterday is that COVID-19 has been the biggest digital accelerator. Let's say if you would go back to beginning of 2020, which has been one of the most challenging years in the last 100 years, um, I think most of the governments were not putting the priority in digital. They were putting other priorities. Of course, everyone is trying to do their best, but digital right now went to the front. It went to the first priority, and every government in the world right now knows that it has to take this serious. Like yesterday, some ministers mentioned the countries that will make a difference are the ones that will take this serious. They will focus in education. They will focus in creating strategies, policies, and ways and solutions that can take this forward and can make a big difference. That's what we try to do with this summit. And the platform that is behind it, openbusinesscouncil.org, <clears throat> is precisely an open business and open society 5.0 focus on making this. We're going to start precisely with the Minister Naokazu Takamoto, that is uh, behind the government of Japan strategy for state science and technology. 
And the Japanese government created the concept of Society 5.0. That is a wonderful concept that can actually make the bridge between a human nature centric super intelligence society where actually we can use these tools to serve us and not the other way around. So we still have a lot of challenge in the world. We have a huge disproportion of the inequality. We have still a lot of countries that are under extreme poverty and the COVID-19 actually create a huge disruption because it creates a lot of poverty and a lot of disruption. But it's creating as well a lot of new tools for us to empower people with financial inclusion, education, and a lot of other things. So if you tackle this right now, and if you work together, we can actually create a lot of solutions. So I want to highlight this, and the panels today are going to be precisely about this. We have panels like how can governments, business, universities develop education policies and solutions, where we have leading personalities discussing this. We have how blockchain and 4AR, for of industrial revolution, can transform traditional business, governments, impact the markets, ecosystems in the future. And governments and smart cities, a very important concept that is more important than ever. And of course, looking at the fusion of 5G, AI, blockchain, big data, IoT, and cybersecurity as well. How we can actually look at roads to smart sustainability, accessibility, inclusive society. So I will just right now put some notes about the, the co-host for the first session um, and the moderator, which is Mr. Eric van der Cleve, that is a dear friend and someone I deeply respect. And I think he's a great uh, personality to uh, jumpstart this second day. So Eric van der Cleve is the technology entrepreneur and CEO the, of the edenbase.com, a new venture that is going to be explaining. And as well, he's been leading the UK government strategies or being part of that strategy to empower the British society to look at how tech can actually create better solutions. And as well, it's been very successful in the last uh, eight, nine years, the UK became in the forefront of technology. And nine years before, London, for instance, was a capital of technology and finance, well, it's mostly finance, but there was not the technology of uh, capital like it is right now. So that work was done between a work between different uh, people in society and it was a huge success. I have a lot of respect for Eric and I think he's going to be coordinating a great panel between uh, one of the personalities of the government of Japan, one of the leading economies in the world, and as well Tina Jabin that is going to be uh, joining us from Bangladesh and talking as well about the Bangladesh economy where she's leading the startup sector and working particularly with the government and the business to take a better opportunity. So I welcome everyone listening to us in the world and join us for this celebration of ideas and as well solutions for our society. Thank you all. And Eric, I pass the word to you, I think probably in one minute. Good morning. How are you? Can you still hear me? Oops. Oh, a little bit of a choppy signal there. Let's try that again. Uh, uh, Ochi-san, can you hear me? Takamoto-san, can you hear me? No, we don't hear any sound. Let's see. You are on mute, uh, Kato. Michael. Michael. Here we go. Very poor sound poor quality. Sound. I think maybe reconnect would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. えっと、ちょっとバイクオープン。あ、じゃあ、僕そっち行きましょうかね。これ来ますね。マジでそっちの。ここのライン、リコネクト。ちょっと、ちょっと。ちょっと、ちょっと。ちょっと、ちょっと
。何を言ってるいや、今ね、あのあ彼女がそのバングラディシアです。ああ、ティナ、ナイス。Very good afternoon from Dhaka. From Dhaka. Okay. Honorable Minister Naokazu Takamoto. A good evening. Nice meeting. Nice meeting. Katu, can you push your screen for us to see the face of the minister and yours? Because we can only see part of Yeah, much better now. Thank you. Aye, <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All right. All right. I'll let set. you go. You are all set up. Good question. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hajime Mashita, welcome. Hajime <laughs> Good job. Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Eric van der Klee. I'm the chief executive of Edenbase.com. A post COVID uh, launched ecosystem and hub、uh, that really focuses on supporting startups, digital, and technology. I will be moderating today, and I have the privilege of interviewing a very esteemed、uh, panelist. So, thank you all very much for joining.、Uh, I will ask you, if I may, to please first introduce uh, yourselves. Uh, starting ladies first with、uh, Tina Jabin. Tina is the CEO of, and managing director of Startup Bangladesh. Which is part of the ICT ministry for the government of Bangladesh. Tina, would you mind just introducing yourself and tell, telling us just in a minute a little bit about yourself? Sure.、Uh, thank you so much, Eric.、Um, a very good afternoon from Dhaka, Bangladesh here.、Um, Honorable Minister、uh, Naokazu Takamoto.、Um, it's very nice. It's an honor to be、um, in the same、uh, program with you.、Um, so, like you said, Eric, Startup Bangladesh Limited, it is A flagship venture capital firm,、uh, which is、um, basically wholly owned by the government of Bangladesh、uh, under the Ministry of ICT. And、uh, this has been conceived under the visionary guidance of our Honorable、uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina、um, and a very generous allocation of about、uh, $60 million,、um, which is you know, part of the digital Bangladesh strategy. As you know, that、uh, the architect of Digital Bangladesh, Shojit Wajid Joy,、um, is you know, leading the ICT sector and um, uh, uh, under um, a very, very able leadership of our、um, Honorable State Minister of ICT,、uh, Mr. Zunaid Ahmed Kolo.、Um, so the fund is going to just make you know, regular, just as an investment fund, venture fund, it's going to make equity investments in、um, seed and growth stage companies.、Um, also, probably a little bit of a Um, uh, investments in the pre seed companies.、Um, I will just stop here and then probably you know, uh, uh, hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, a very、uh, great honor also to welcome Takamoto san, Minister of State for Science and Technology Policy, and Ochi san, Special Advisor to the State Minister. Business and political consultant, amazing TV personality, strategist, film personality. It's fantastic <laughs> to hear you guys here. Welcome. Haji Haji Mimashta.、Um, Haji Mimashta. Thank you very much for your invitation.、Uh, uh, I have been working、uh, until two months ago as a state minister for、uh, technology. Science so, and science and technology, okay. And uh, uh, This time,、uh, I'm very much、uh, glad to have this kind of、uh, very unique chance to talk with、uh, so many people all over the world. And,、uh, you know,、uh, we are very much、uh, suffering from the COVID 19. And every day, the infected people, the number of the people are increasing every day.、Uh, not so serious as the United States or the European country. However, I'm afraid it becomes the same situation. So,、uh, anyhow,、uh, we have to change the views about the COVID 19、uh, with uh, all of、uh, the world friends. Okay, anyhow,、uh, we are,、uh, our government is now、uh, paying a great effort to build up.、Uh, AI system all over this country. And uh, uh, while, while I was、uh, serving as a state minister, I made a plan to uh, uh, unite all of the ministries、uh, within three years as a,、uh, one, 
wrong. So uh, hmm. uh, within a year, maybe the next September, uh, our government will uh, establish uh, the, the digital transformation. digital transformation agency. Yeah, hmm. and every information should be centered on this agency. Uh, I think in so doing, you know, we can uh, uh, catch up with uh, the advanced country, the, the United States or that's some of the uh, countries. Thank you, thank you. It's a huge challenge, I'm sure, yes. uh, which is uh, especially trying to get three government departments to work together. Having worked in uh, number 10 Downing Street before, I realize how challenging that can be. Mm -hmm. But uh, Kevin, let me yeah. ask you a question, if I may. Sure. Um, which is, as you move from uh, science and technology to think about just digital transformation, how is Japan looking at just the transformation to digital? What are the kind of things that they're looking at at the moment? Well, um, as the minister just uh, uh, told us, that uh, the uh, Digital Transformation Agency is to be established in uh, September 2021, which is next year, I think. Right. And they'll be launching uh, all sorts of uh, functions uh, there, I think. And it's the first time for such an agency to have been created, right? Exactly. I mean, uh, Japan, um, obviously, I don't know about other countries, but I've been in Japan for more than 20 years. I <clears throat> feel um, that most uh, the agencies here, ministries are... Uh, very much sectionalized and uh, they don't really and then the, the one uh, big agency or the ministry should i call it the ministry of finance is the one that holds the budget and the every all other agencies and ministries are like after them after that money and so there's a big competition among them and uh and therefore that strengthened their uh, sectionalism, so to speak, you know, so they, mm -hmm. they, they hardly interact and they always fight their turf war and such. But by bringing this digital transformation, every single information data will be uh, sucked up to this one particular agency, which is some fear that this agency could even compete or maybe uh, become more powerful than the existing financial the finance agent financial uh ministry so that's something that uh, we need to see how things will turn out will turn out but um, yeah uh this digital transformation will probably hopefully uh stop put a stop to this sectionalism and turf war among the uh, the ministries and 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 the the competition which is not exactly serving well for the for the ordinary people for the people of japan so um, I have how high hopes for that. Yeah. It is interesting because in the past, um, we have seen examples in Japan of where the major Japanese corporations would collaborate and co-invest in R&D to actually then share the IP. That's long in the hist historic past. But, uh, but it is interesting because as digital becomes an incredibly important part of the economy, it would seem logical to create a digital uh, agency uh, that actually was responsible for that. But I understand that change is always challenging. Uh, but moving to uh, Bangladesh and what's happening there at the moment, um, Tina, it's, it's, very, it's very exciting, I hear. Uh, but you've also experienced uh, San Francisco, haven't you? Which is, um, uh, I think that that's interesting. What, what do you feel the main difference is then between, say, the U.S. Uh, startup society and the and the challenges and excitement of what's happening in Bangladesh. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I think that you know San Francisco and uh, Dhaka, they are um, uh, you know very different place, different culture, different resources. But one thing that is very common, which is the entrepreneurial spirit, right? Bangladesh is by DNA is an entrepreneurial country. You will see everybody here, you know, um, even though they are working and you know holding a job, they are doing something on the side, and um, so you know that is an entrepreneurial spirit. 
what is lacking here is the is the access to resources financial resources right. technology the best technology and, and you know that that is uh, totally um, reasonable right because you know bangladesh is still um, inching towards uh, actually it has uh, it, it is um, uh, reached the middle income country status but you know it is inching towards the, the ambition is to become a high income country so it is um, so you know um, so all the all the resources is not going to be the exactly the same in san francisco what is in san francisco that you know i have seen i was there for almost 27 years i still have my primary um, you know uh, home front there uh, but what i have seen is that you know the uh, the access to resources <coughs> finance you know the ecosystem is already built right so there is a lot more it's easy for startups to go and uh, pitch to um, uh, a vc fund in the uh, in, on Sandhill road but not the same in dhaka bangladesh bangladesh overall because the whole ecosystem is uh, not more than six seven years old and uh, truly the ecosystem kind of starting getting traction in last five years and really took off in last four years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very, so if very you compare, right, if you compare the the what they have accomplished in last four years, that is impressive. With the limited resources, with yeah. not a very much, you know, the venture capital ecosystem or the um, the atmosphere here. Um, sure. So that would be my uh, my comment. That's very helpful. Yes. One of the things that I realized was mm -hmm. that, uh, of course. Uh, Japan, I think, is one of the biggest investors in uh, inward investors into Bangladesh in any way, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps you can tell yeah. us a little about, about that and the priorities that you are facing in Japan. Well, well. well we are doing a great uh, and uh, paying a great effort to develop uh, uh, startups in this uh, in our country. And to tell the truth, you the number of uh, unicorn. It's only few, maybe four or so, but the United, mm -hmm. United States more than 200, and yeah. Europe the, the same number, I think. So, you know, we have to develop a uh, startup. So, you know, uh, this uh, spring, last spring, you know, uh, we have decided to build up uh, Silicon Valley in Japan, Japan's major city, Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, Fukuoka. And, uh, uh, we are going to elevate, uh, giving us uh, subsidized or some other thing, you know. Uh, those startup will grow up, become a big one. Uh, if they need uh, some uh, assistance uh, from the government or some other uh, institution, we uh, we are uh, helping them. So in so doing, you know, uh, sooner or later, maybe three or four years, you know, we may have uh, 20 or 30 unicorns, <laughs> yeah. Ah. And uh, in so doing, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, started to teach the uh, Japanese younger people and uh, also the uh, younger people who want to become a startup uh, how to uh, uh, collect uh, information, uh, how to invent a technology, uh, how to uh, take a uh investment from other world or something like that you know through one year we are giving uh, so many lectures yeah and it's so doing you know yeah, yeah, younger people will become a big big uh, <laughs> uh big uh, entrepreneurs yeah entrepreneur yes oh wonderful that would yeah. be uh sugoi ne? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be great if that's possible but yeah. my question for you then, uh, uh, Takamoto-san, is the, the, to, to create a strategy like that requires education, culture, mm. and also policy. Do you mm. think that Japan will implement uh, policies to support uh, super growth and uh, unicorn uh, mm. and entrepreneurship? Yeah, to tell the truth, you know, uh, if uh, some idea is uh, invented, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, for example, future Nobel Prize or something that, like that, you know, the, uh, the evaluation of this idea 
is very low compared with the case of the United States. Maybe uh, one twenties is my I, my sense, you know. So the brilliant young people will go to Europe or the United States. Uh, so those people can get the money there, but not in Japan. But we have to uh, improve, change this situation. Um, th this is a, a role of the government, I think, that we have did so many things, but nevertheless, you know, uh, for example, uh, Ethiopian, one million US dollars. One, one million US dollars will be given to uh, some researcher or some uh, mm. uh, who are studying or working in the universities. And we select uh, maybe 300 people all over Japan, but something like that. So, you know, in so doing, you know, uh, we accelerate those young people will apply for the future. And what, what's more, uh, the government, you know, uh, we uh, are going to develop a new technology. Yeah, we call this one Moonshot, Moonshot program. Yeah. Mm. Eight, eight, eight uh, projects we have, yeah including uh, 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 some uh, idea uh, to combat with uh, uh, COVID-19. <laughs> oh, very good. That, yeah, yeah. The, the whole world will want to, to know about that. So yeah. <laughs> that's a great idea. Okay. Yeah, well, we, well, we look forward to learning more about that. I think a moonshot program is a brilliant mm -hmm. idea. but. Uh, Tina, the government of Bangladesh is working on a big technology startup uh, ambitious plan and mm. fund. Mm. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that and the ambitions? If it is successful, what, what, what happens in, say, five years' time? What will have happened? Thank you, Eric. Um, you are absolutely right. The government of Bangladesh, um, under the visionary guidance of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, um, we are working on an extremely ambitious plan, which is um, based on technology, because, you know, the technology is the way to go, right, to transform a society, to bring large scale impact and to reach the last miles and, to, you know, to um, uh, achieve the SDG 2030 goals. So with that in mind, you know, technology is being um, incorporated in all our national plans in any type of uh, public works, infrastructure and whatnot. Mm. And right now, um, what we are doing is the ICT ministry have this massive uh, project, couple of big projects, I'll just say very quickly. One is the High Tech Park Authority, Bangladesh High Tech Park Authority. Um, and there is like almost uh, uh, 39 uh, high tech park and you know special technology park that is under development and some are in operations and the idea is to host you know technology farms and not only that to bring you know uh, foreign manufacturers such as you know samsung is right now producing some of their manufacturing some of their uh, most uh, latest uh, phones in uh, one of these technology parks so you know that's one so that is kind of like a made in bangladesh campaign where you know all these tech gadgets are going to be made in Bangladesh and will be exported. So that's one, the other, right? The other one is definitely the startup ecosystem because in every single facet, you can plug in a startup because they are agile and they have innovative ideas. And if it works, then you know you can scale up. So so you know that's how our startup Bangladesh Limited, this VC fund, has been um, uh, kind of launched. Um, so you know startups are everywhere and. Um, uh, the verticals that, um, and also logistics um, and uh, mental well-being is also a big factor that is being, you know, kind of um, highlighted in our um, national plans and also the ICT roadmap. Very cool. Very cool. Um, Kevin and uh, uh, Takamoto-san, I, I yes. want to, to say that in the United Kingdom, we, when I was working for the Prime Minister, we had a very special event the London Olympics, which oh. we used to attract startups from all over the world as a big kickstart opportunity for startup and digital. Mm -hmm. uh, we are so excited around the world that Japan has given the go ahead for the Olympics again. Uh, it's a very good chance, I think, 
to shine a light on what Japan is doing. Uh, I mean, for either of you, do you think that it will be possible or do you think COVID will slow that down? Well, we are now um, struggling with this, okay? Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we are strong, eager to hold uh, Olymp Tokyo Olympic Games next year. Uh, however, the, the COVID-19 is very strong, become very strong and stronger. Therefore, uh, maybe the next summer, uh, this uh, COVID-19 will become very slow, uh, small and uh, yeah. weak. Okay? I see. And, uh, we still have a strong desire to hold that, but we have to devise how to defend ourselves, how to defend the prayer uh, from the, this uh, uh, pandemic disease. Okay? Uh, we have to use uh, uh, technology. Yes. Yeah, and uh, idea. Well, we are very happy to share with you. We have just Thank launched you. our mm. competition in the UK for mm. finding COVID beating solutions mm. for travel mm. and places. Mm. So, which means uh, schools, uh, stadiums, uh, anything. And we will invest in these companies and we want them to go global. So if mm. we find any good solutions, we will share them with you because I think the whole world will want to know about this. Thank you. Thank and you. Um, what's more, uh, uh, in 2025, we are going to hold an exposition in Osaka, the second largest city in this country. Yeah. I remember going to Osaka, but tell me more about the uh, exposition. Exposition. The World Expo 25. World exposition, yes. So what is the ambition for that? We are going to show the uh, high technologies uh, in the near future. For example, uh, flying a taxi. <laughs> wow, Anthony. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. Please, please. We recommend you. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's really, really good. Um, Kevin, what do you think the priorities will be for Japan as it faces this transformation for digital and fighting COVID? Well, I'm actually not exactly, uh, I, I think, my, I personally think that COVID-19 yeah. has been overplayed. And given the fact that the death rate and the, and the, uh, <laughs> the severe cases are like uh, really going down. However, we're counting numbers of uh, positive cases and it's the, it, it's, the numbers are proportionally inversed. And we know that we have more, we, because we, uh, we practice more tests, we practice PCR tests. And then as a result, you get more number of people uh, being, uh, right. they, these days they call it infected, but they used to call it in Japan as well, you know, on news channels, they would say positive cases, but now somehow we kind of changed the word to infected, which is kind of, I mean, I'm not exactly a conspiracy theorist or, you know, I don't buy all those uh, stuff, but then again, but right there, yes. I think that's quite interesting. Perhaps the, um, the government might think of creating a taxonomy and a guidance for us to acknowledge, but then emerge. That might be a yeah, great And then some thing. argue that, you know, the uh, vaccination, the vaccines uh, now it's being prepared and then ready to be uh, given to people. And of course the government subsidy will buy a whole bunch of it to, you know, to uh, yeah. give it to, yeah. dis to uh, distribute to everybody else, to everybody. Mm -hmm. And that alone is a big business. So there's, a, mm -hmm. I, there's a, <clears throat> of some kind of business schemes or interest or it's really hard to say but uh you're always going to get the uh, conspiracy theorists and i think that the vast majority of people matter, understand yeah. the amazing benefits that vaccine have given to society in the world and the that's, PCR test as well yeah no that's true mm -hmm. tina um i wanted to say that ask that uh, from our observations we've seen that bangladesh really has, when you think about it, been managing COVID pretty well, comparatively. So that's, that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's quite a difficult challenge, but nonetheless, it's important. And that's one important issue. But the other issue, which I think you hinted at, is sustainability and the ESGs. How does that um, 
propagate into the work you're doing? Can you do do you within your start work and startup Bangladesh desk focus on sustainability and ESGs as a sector? Of course. I mean, you know, um, it, that is like an unwritten um, rule, right? Because, you know, the country and the country wants to um, accomplish the SDG 2030 goals. And that's not just, you know, a check mark. That's because as a country, if you want to enter um, as a high income country and if you want to sustain that, you know, you need to have a country which is inclusive for everybody it's sustainable whatever the programs and the lifestyle is and also it needs to be humane right so these are things that is kind of sitting on top of all the business plans and the and the other national plans so with that in mind of course you know when we are um, looking at our selections for investments for example very small example from what we do from Tata Bangladesh Limited we actually also look at okay you know these are the um, uh, startups that we will we are looking at uh, for as possible investments and what type of sdg impact are they going to bring for example you know right now one of a big uh, trust factor is fintech uh, edutech health tech right so in all of this you know quite a few sdg um, are going to be met i mean you know zero poverty no more right. that behind, right um, so yes, absolutely, uh, and one of them is very important to gender family. You also keep. Takamoto-san, do so. Yeah, 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 do so. We have our country received uh, 24 people received the uh, Nobel Prize already. And uh, the, in case of the United States, uh, maybe 180 or so. So, but the Japan is the second in the world. Hmm. China is the only one. Hmm. Korea, zero. So compared with those hmm. situations, you know, Japanese technology is very much advanced. However, mm -hmm. now we are we have not uh, have a strong confidence in developing uh, this technology. Therefore, we have to uh, uh, give a good uh, salary to the uh, researcher and mm -hmm. the people. Awards, uh, yeah. So incentives, yeah. Yeah, incentive, incentive. Uh, mm. uh, the I have a grad from the University of California at Berkeley. The professor of this uh, uh, university uh, was given a uh, young seminar, right? Four hundred thousand US. Four hundred thousand US dollars. But in oh. case of the Tokyo University professor, uh, no. Hundred uh, twenty thousand. Hundred twenty thousand. Mm. Maybe one thousand. One thousand. This is the reality. That because right. that you know, uh, very brilliant young people will go out from. Yeah. They will leave the country. Brain drain. Yeah. 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 Brain drain. That's very interesting. So uh, I was hired by the UK government to reverse the brain drain, uh, and we created a program to find the brightest and the best and attract them back to the UK. Mm. It's a very successful program. It's, it's worked mm. very well. Uh, and uh, I actually, uh, Dinesh Gada from Open Business Council knows about that program because uh, mm. I gave him information and I strongly recommend it. But what's wonderful is that as a former minister is that you are highlighting the challenges Mm. And ask, and you're not frightened to say so, which is wonderful. So we we want to encourage you to do more. Thank you, <laughs> because it does take uh, it takes uh, these change. But can I ask you, as a as someone that was responsible, a minister for science and technology until only two months ago, how difficult is it for government departments to embrace change? For example, uh, is it possible that government can say 
all government departments should use blockchain by a certain date and create efficiency. Is it possible or is it very difficult? It's a bit difficult, but it's possible. Uh, I'm not sure we are paying a strong uh, effort to do that. Uh, we are asking so many people in so many uh, agencies and different department of the government, you know, uh, you should use a blockchain or some other thing, CBDC or some other thing. The China is now experiencing a CBDC. Yes. Uh, Bank of Japan was quite against until last year, but mm. very recently they changed their attitude. They are now trying to uh, make a research and uh, trying to uh, experience uh, uh, this. Active, activate uh, activate the CBDC. Yes, but we want to encourage that because we we believe that uh, it could transform uh, international trade. CBDC could remove a lot of friction in trade. So we, it's a, a very interesting idea. Uh, yeah. We hope it will be successful. I think everything will depend on the relationship between demand and supply. Okay, people yes. want to have. Uh, uh, very convenient uh, money, money, and if it's not always the supported by the government, if it's a uh, usable between the one person and the one person, both both of them are giving a consent. Okay, everything's okay. Mm. Uh, days, you know, people are changing the goods, goods, uh, uh, potato with the other people. Eh? Birthday economy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, coins, uh, not, uh, crypto cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is a kind of. Uh, 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 Border economy. Bar <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, we hope that uh, the technologies behind cryptocurrency. Mm. Uh, will gradually become mainstream and mainly yeah. blockchain. But because, very important reason, it potential for creating trust mm. where trust is difficult and efficiency mm. where efficiency is difficult. So we are very hopeful for that. Yeah, but Eric, it takes policy uh, making. Yeah, but Eric, um, you know, cryptocurrency and CBDC is a two different. It's adult, you know, apples and oranges. Like it's a, it's a different thing. You know, CDBC is like issued by the central bank. It's mm, actually yes. money, the real money. Whereas yeah. uh, crypto is more or less a speculation. It's it's more like well, one is uh, one is decentralized and one is centralized. And yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is interesting because uh, I joined the Bank of England uh, uh, consultations on CBDC, mm -hmm. and they are asking the questions whether it should be centralized or whether it should be decentralized as a philosophy. Um, and I think the biggest fear that any central government has with CBDC is the potential for systemic disruption to the economy. So those controls have to be in place, but it's early in that, in that space and we, well, we will watch it with great. Yes, yeah, Eric, when, you know, obviously with COVID-19, the whole world, the central banks are easing their interest rates and, you know, quantum yeah. easing and all that stuff that if you, if you decentralize the, the digital currencies worldwide, that will not happen. That cannot be taken place. I mean, it, it's not, it's not going to, that's why we need to have something, a, a sort of like a, a go between of a centralized mm -hmm. and a decentralized money. Mm -hmm. the, otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, there's no way that we can control the, the, the sentiment or the business sentiment or the economy of the world. So that, that's why some, there's a lot of, and then you, you have to chip, you know, sort of like bring in the China factor as well. And maybe the world might, be, become like divided into two different factions, United States allies and the Chinese allies. And so there's a, a lot of uh, part, moving parts right now as we move it forward. Uh, into, uh, well, we will watch it with great interest. And it's yeah. very good to see uh, Japan and many countries uh, discussing this at the moment. Uh, Tina, yeah. do you know if uh, there have been discussions and exploration and consultation about this in Bangladesh? Um, you know, I have to say that there, um, there is, um, there is the discussion. Of course, there is, but in a limited scale. Uh, but we are 
looking into, and this is just in a very, very um, uh, initial stage that, you know, looking into a digital currency. So, but you know, I'm not the expert on that side. So, um, no. you know, not much I can no share. Worries. Well, actually, while I have you, I want to ask you a question. If, uh, if we, uh, and in this section, I wanted to ask us to either perhaps make some predictions or maybe what we hope might happen. So considering that society, and Tina, if I can ask you first, considering that society and the economy has taken such a tough impact because of COVID, uh, what do we think, for example, the startup society can do to help recover that? And how long do you think it will take to before it returns to where it was um, pre-COVID? I'm so glad that you asked me this question because now I can show off about my startups because I can tell you how the startups have really uh, got plugged into uh, the system and you know e-commerce site totally exploded e-commerce business exploded because you know the lockdowns the startups were doing these deliveries um, the the you know the FMCG startups the online stores like uh, Chaldal is one of them their business exploded the logistics um, uh, uh, like Patao uh, they were doing you know these delivery services um, and also so you know these they have really plugged in the mental well-being startups they were taking uh, such as Maya Appa and Monir Bondu they were taking yeah. like thousands of calls education startups startup Bangladesh limited right now has about 20 education startups at tech startups who are providing content to the education ministry for their national curriculum online content so you know they have to plugged in and um and Tina, this I'm sorry so, sorry sorry to interrupt you i've just uh, had no. a signal that we're going to lose the minister soon so i just want to get one last word from him yes. before before he goes but thank you so much tina for for, for that we, we're very ambitious uh well, final oh. question for you um which is if we are or if your ambitions for Japan and society are successful, uh, I think we will see a good chance. It's a good chance to recover uh, quickly, but it will take time. Uh, if you were to give a message to your colleagues uh, around the world in, in, uh, in, in similar roles to yourself, what would it be? Well, uh, our country, in some sense, an advanced country as far as the technology is concerned. So, under the, this situation, I mean, the whole the world is covered with COVID-19. Uh, we can we can survive from this uh, very severe situation. So, for example, the death rate of uh, COVID-19 is very very small compared with uh, European country and uh, the United States. You know, uh, I don't know the reason why. However, it's a it's a true. So you know, we come out from uh, uh, this uh, very severe situation. Mm. So, but more, our society is a very aged society, maybe the one of the most aged country in the world. So mm. uh, we can survive from this very severe situation. This experience, this technology will be uh, studied by some other uh, countries in the future. Mm. Well, I think uh, we can uh, contribute to the uh, health of our people. <laughs> uh, thank you. We would like that very much. And actually, I want to thank uh, Open Business Council because their number one goal is to share knowledge like this between yes. the world. And so I'm very keen supporter of that. So if I may, I would like to thank all the panelists for kindly uh, participating. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Kevin. Much appreciated. And I really look forward to coming to Japan and going in your flying taxi. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. Please come to Japan. By all means. Yeah. Very nice. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. See you again. Bye. See you again. See you again. Thank you. Thank you. See you again. Bye. Hi everyone.
Hello. Dennis is speaking with someone. <laughs> okay. Apologies. So, thank you so much for joining me. Um, uh, so, I, I welcome right now. So, we finish right now the first panel with uh, Minister Takamoto and uh, Tina. It was a very uh, exciting way of looking at two very di divergent economies. So, Japanese economy, the third biggest country and economy in the world in terms of economy, and as well Bangladesh, which is uh, in terms of population one of the biggest countries in the world and as well an emerging economy with a lot of uh, capacity to go forward so i welcome this panel they will be precisely talking about uh, um continuation of this uh previous panel so we're going to be talking about the global government business and startup tech landscape post covid challenge and opportunities so i'll start slowly just uh, highlighting a bit of uh, each of the speakers so i welcome alexander borniakov deputy minister of digital transformation for ukraine and tina jabin we saw previously so managing director and ceo of startup bangladesh part of the ict government minister department trang van tang they will join us uh, through a video um uh, deputy minister of science and technology of vietnam and q me doan that is joining as well from Vietnam and is working with the Minister of, of Science and Technology. And she's as well behind the Vietnam Digital Transformation Frontier Tech Organization. She will tell us a bit more about her. So we have a very diverse, and of course, I cannot forget, we have as well um, on the panel, Luisa Rubio Rivas. That is the only non-governmental person here, but is as well leading a global uh, organization, part of the Telefonica Telecom Group, that is YREX which is one of the biggest accelerators of technology in the world that has been doing fantastic work, almost all the world, in terms of accelerating and creating um, an ecosystem for startups. So I would like, uh, if possible, for each of you to do a small presentation because it's a great, I'm looking forward to hear from you and uh, probably starting by the ladies. We have three ladies, so Alex will we'll work there as well, but I think it's a very diverse panel as well. I don't know, uh, Louisa, probably start by you because Tina introduced sure. herself and then, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. So thank you, Denise. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone from Spain. I'm very grateful to to participate in this amazing panel um, representing Waira and, and Telefonica. So as Denise said, Telefonica is one of the biggest telecommunication companies in the world. We have around 350 million customers in our markets in Europe and in Latin America, operating in 12 countries, presence in 24, and uh, more than 100,000 employees. So as you can imagine, innovation and collaboration between startups, corporations, governments, it's something crucial for a company such as Telefonica. We need others to, to innovate. That's not something we can do um, only by by ourselves. So that's why we have built a quite relevant open innovation unit of which Waira is part um, to 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 open Telefonica to startups, corporation, governments, you know, to to different different partners. And we have been doing this almost for for ten years, but. Um, we, we we do it not because it's trendy or because that's um, what we should do in terms of corporate um, social responsibility. We do it because it makes sense in terms of business and in terms of, of impact. And just to give you an idea in terms of economic impact, last year we made more than 35 million in business only in Spain between the startups in our portfolio, Telefonica, and our customers so uh, you can also think for example in terms of employment we have invested in telefonica in more than 900 startups if we consider all the investment vehicles that we have so if each startup has 20 employees on average just to be conservative the impact is is huge so of course it's a big challenge as the title of 
these panel stats, but it also represents a great opportunity. It requires a lot of effort, but the outcome um, you could get um, could be terrific. And that's how we see it from Waira and from Telefonica. And that's why we have decided to, to challenge ourselves again in, in this crazy year 2020, uh, launching this new project I'm, I'm leading, Waira X. So YRX is Telefonica's digital uh, open innovation hub to invest in pure digital startups, which are developing products that could become massive anywhere in the world. So this is a very um, ambitious investment project um, with, with a, a new investment strategy to, to generate collaboration between startups, governments, and, and other corporations. And, here I would like to point out two to different ways uh, that we are managing this, this collaboration. First of all, uh, related to the scouting efforts, you know, because it's crucial to detect the best talent, no matter um, where is it located, to have like strong relations with different partners, with governments especially, you know, um, to, to have a good overview about what's going on in their local ecosystems to detect the best talent, and also to help uh, our startups when we make a new investment to grow and to enter into different markets. So I'd be more than happy to engage with all the people connecting today to the event and, and to explore uh, potential synergies and solving new challenges together. Thank you, and uh, and I think it's a very a great example because with 300 million customers worldwide, you are uh, you reach as much as a lot of countries and big economies, and as well one of the biggest corporations in the planet. Um, so I, I want to go to to Vietnam. Uh, so Duan Kim Yu, uh, Kim Iku, as you are known. So Vietnam is a very fast growing economy as well with 100 million people and very young people. And you've been making the bridge between the startup ecosystem in Vietnam but as well all over the, the countries around that, but as well in Europe, but as well you work with the government. So can you give us a bit of a context in terms of both the initiatives of the government um, and as well what you've been doing in terms of the work between the startup and you did, you did a big festival with the government recently. So I wanna highlight that. Uh, please uh, let us know about you and about that. Thank you, uh, Dennis, and um, uh, it's my honor today to share um, in terms of like the upcoming initiatives from Vietnam. So actually, um, in Vietnam, we have like the saying that actually we are like the next hottest destination in Southeast Asia. So after just after Indonesia, now Vietnam is like the next destination. And my name is Kimiko. I'm uh, one of the top ten most influential uh, women in tech uh, by Analytics Insight. And uh, I founded Yellow Blocks as like the first emerging technology consulting firm to connect Vietnam and the world, uh, specifically for frontier technologies and deep tech. So for um, Yellow Blocks, within the first, uh, the last three years, we have built the strategic partnerships with Vietnam government, uh, Singaporean government, Austrian and Australian government. And our focus is to bridge the gap between like the um, investors when they come into Vietnam to have like a whole uh, ecosystem overview and also to provide the market insights uh, for Vietnam who want to go to different countries by partnerships. So uh, in our network currently, we we have like multiple uh, biggest telcos in Vietnam, biggest uh, technology companies in Vietnam. And then we talk on the government level when we discuss like uh, when we introduce them for the higher partnership level. So later on, Denise is going to show you one of the video. Um, uh, unfortunately, our deputy minister, uh, Mr. Tung, cannot join uh, our discussion today, but he has pre-recorded a sharing uh, and in which we will show, showcase some of the tech fest. So TechFest is one big uh, initiative that we started in Vietnam six years ago, when like the startup world is actually, uh, the, the startup definition is not yet very well defined in Vietnam. So TechFest is like the biggest technology uh, festival and conferences uh, that prolong uh, from three to four days. And before that, we have a lot of uh, activation and event in different provinces. We have 64 provinces in Vietnam and uh, we gather on the top of these 64 provinces and then gather in the biggest tech fest 
And our um, TechFest just finished uh, two weeks ago, in which Denise was also an ordinary speaker. And uh, apparently, TechFest, uh, by joining TechFest for the last six years, uh, in terms of like being the co-host and also one of the strategic supporters, uh, I have seen a lot of improvement in Vietnam ecosystem. And I think this is also a very uh, big effort from the Vietnam government. Uh, when they, um, uh, for the last three years, we have seen like very big initiative uh, we have uh, the whole project named 844, uh, the, the decree 844 that states out that this is the year for staff and Ministry of Science and Technology actually have like the honor from the Prime Minister to say that uh, from 2020, um, Ministry of Science and Technology is one of our focus in terms of our digital strategy to increase the economic growth of the country. So now every effort is being put into how to uh, improve, increase like the competitiveness of the whole ecosystem landscape and more and more we are more um, interested into like the potential of uh, deep tech and frontier tech in terms of smart cities. So we also have a lot of big projects going on right now. Thank you so much, uh, Kimiko. So uh, Tina, in Bangladesh, you mentioned a bit before, but you didn't go too much in your work in the startup Bangladesh Limited, working as well, working with the minister and with the government to push the, the startup and, and technology ecosystem in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is a very big population, very young. And uh, as well, you come from Silicon Valley. So you work in one of the biggest corporations in the world as well. So a bit of a, that background that uh, the previous fireside, there was not so much time, but just highlighting that. Uh, because I think it's interesting, both you and Alex have a very similar background, but I think it's interesting to hear that as well, from Silicon Valley to right now leading an emerging company, and you are one of the biggest corporations in the world. Yeah, thank you so much, Denise, and um, hello, good afternoon to my esteemed uh, panelists here. It was really nice hearing uh, Luisa Rubio's uh, story. Um, that you know they are they want to connect to the startups right because they will bring the solution so i would love to reach out to you later after our session because we also have telcos who are doing the same thing they have accelerators um uh, who are you know supporting the telcos they are supporting accelerators actually they themselves have accelerators uh, where they're bringing all kind of um, incubating all kind of solutions by startups such as you know the Telenor accelerator which is the GP accelerator, Ramin Phone, and then our ventures, that is Robi Aziada accelerator. And it was really good, um, you know, listening to um, Miss um, Kumi Duan, um, you know, the Vietnam story. And um, it's kind of similar in Bangladesh. And Denise, if you don't mind, I'll just share the Bangladesh story. I think, you know, it will really flow well. So Bangladesh startup story is really started about seven, eight years ago and really um, got traction about probably four or five years ago. So uh, when we started um, Startup Bangladesh campaign, uh, initially this was um, like a grant platform. It's called Idea um, Desi De Innovation Design Entrepreneurship Academy, Idea. So it's a grant platform. Um, and under that platform, you know, the, about four years ago, we so far funded um, 157 startups and it's ongoing. But what has happened is, you know, at that time, uh, there were a couple of accelerators, like I just said, GP Accelerator and, and, and uh, um, one more from one of the other telco. Um, and then Startup Dhaka was another one. Uh, but then when the government comes in, right, where there is, um, it's a very nascent ecosystem, the private industry gets very psyched up. So at that time, you know, we did a, a competition call for solutions for startups. And then we got about 273 uh, submissions. But now, you know, we just finished Ideathon with um, the Korean government um, and IDEA project. Um, there was, um, I was, I read it yesterday, there is like about more than 3,000 submissions. So you can imagine that how sensitized um, the ecosystem has become. And as far as, you know, some real number goes, in last five years, the startups, um, the bigger, some of the big startups brought in about uh, almost close to 280 million foreign um, uh, direct uh, investment in the country. Small number when you compare to the valley, but a, but a very big accomplishment, achievement for a country where the ecosystem itself is only seven years old. Um, and then, you know, the, some of the big startups I said, you know, like Patao and Shohoj, Shopops, 
um, um, and then Sheva XYZ, um, they uh, together, the ecosystem employed, employed about 1.5 million people. So these are impressive numbers, right? Um, and now there is about 42 accelerators. Almost every single university has some sort of entrepreneurship club or an or a startup type of club. Um, and you know there is about 2,500 um, healthy startups that is in the system. The real numbers are a lot more, but you know the kind of uh, active startups are, are about 2,500. Um, and you know so the ecosystem is really robust and is on is on fire. And now Startup Bangladesh, our venture capital fund, comes in. And um, you know we are right now in the process of making uh, real equity investments, and this is going to make history uh, because you know you know that government um, venture own venture capital funds are not that many in, in the world, and you know Bangladesh being a, a still a very green country, um, uh, although doing very well, uh, progressing very very well, but you know Bangladesh taking uh, an initiative like that is um, really really um, um, I would say. You know, amazing and awesome. Um, it, it's a landmark. Um, so you know, I I know that we have all these panelists here, and I would love to uh, engage in um, partnership, exploring what we can do and collaborate. Um, you know, in this uh, in this uh, landscape. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much, Tina. And I think uh, you have a very unique spot that Alexandra uh, shares as well. So, Alexandra. Uh, Ukraine is particularly interesting because it has 1.5 million companies um, and is actually one of the most scientific, uh, or at least in terms of science, but as well in terms of technology advanced countries. Although it has, especially during the last year, has been hearing for a lot of different reasons. But uh, I think in terms of uh, the, the tech ecosystem is one of the most uh, cutting edge in terms of uh, developing um, uh, talent and a lot of different things. So can you tell us a bit about the, what you've been doing both, and I know that you have a career as well academic and as well in business, um, what the government has been doing, and of course you're leading that force. And I know you're doing very innovative things in terms of attracting international uh, investment, but as well putting the ecosystem and working with big corporations and so forth. Yeah, thank you. And uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure talking and sharing experience, of course. Um, Look, uh, well, first of all, you mentioned um, the, the ecosystem and the talents. So just to give a brief overview, um, Ukrainian, Ukrainian IT industry, well, together with, I would say, together with the startups, is more than 200,000 people. So those are mostly engineers. Uh, we have just like 15,000 companies just specifically focused on uh, IT and startups. Um, and um, there are... There are really literally a uh, couple great stories came from Ukraine, like GitHub. It's Ukrainian-based company. Uh, recently, uh, there was a company called Reface AI. It hit the uh, top uh, tops of the App Store and Google Play market with the um, artificial intelligence solution that kind of. Uh, but it was a, it has a funny application because it's just. Uh, Put your face in uh, on the celebrities' uh, videos, and and but uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, they reached like 100 million uh, downloads in just uh, a week or so. So and recently they 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 just uh, they uh, raised money from Anderson Horowitz. So the, uh, and also Grammarly is, is also like a unicorn um, startup from Ukraine. So that there there are a number of, um, of of great stories that came out from Ukraine, and we uh, we uh, obviously trying to do more. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what government uh, does, uh, that's uh, uh, let me just give you a, a couple examples. So uh, the biggest one is that uh, Ukrainian government created a fund. It called Ukrainian Startup Fund, and uh, it basically uh, has two um, uh, two goals. First of all, is just give grants from 25 uh, 25 to early stage and 50,000. Um, uh, for a little bit later stage startups. Uh, it's just a grant, so you don't have to get it back. And uh, less than a year, uh, then and, and, uh, they got like uh, 2,000, almost 2,500 applications. Uh, and uh, so, so the government now, in, in Ukraine, government is the big, biggest angel invest, investor. So that's, 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 what we, that's what we did for the last year, and we're very, very proud of it. And the second thing that was a part of, uh, also Tina mentioned that I heard a couple times about accelerators and uh, and uh, 
incubators. So that there's also a weak spot in Ukraine. Uh, there are just a couple of them. And, you know, uh, you mentioned that my, my background, um, uh, before I started a government job, I was in a business and in 2012, I started with my partners, uh, our own like uh, small uh, private uh, venture fund. And we were, we were in 2012, we were among first, I would say three incubators in the country. Later, uh, 2014, the, 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 the start, the, there was like a, 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 a growth of the number, but uh, then in 2014, there was a war with Russia, so everything just went down. So, um, and in a couple of days, of course, it's, it's restored to, to some extent, but when we started Ukrainian startup, what we put uh, the goal that we need not just only give grants, but also create an ecosystem and, uh, and incub incubators and accelerators are part of ecosystem, like essential part of it. So we decided to um, also like stimulate and um, and invite a couple uh, big uh, incubators in the country. So, so far we agreed with US Mark, with Startup Wise Guys uh, and, uh, and one actually from the Spain, I forgot the name, but uh, so uh, right now we have like uh, around 15 to 20 startup accelerators and incubators baked also partially by government and uh, and, and that and that created a uh, uh, better environment for uh, for even early stage and uh, for people who just invented ideas so um, that's the that's like the major thing that we do also now we're coming up with uh, with a huge project it's still in the process but we kind of decided that um uh, we need to make something like very similar to, uh, I don't know what the best example, like like a special economic zone. So, and, and, and we call it DSCD. So that's uh, that's basically a virtual business country where we, we decided to implement uh, uh, kind of like sort of a English law um, elements because we don't, we didn't have like convertible nodes. We didn't have uh, um, uh, safe agreements like liquidation preferences, uh, non-solicit agreement, non-compete, and other stuff that's very common in the world. So this is what we do as a government. So we decided to put in our legislation, in our laws, those terms. So so investor from outside could come to Ukraine, invest in startups, and 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 don't waste with because we have a lot of USSR legacy. That's obviously from like like times 20, 30 years ago. So we just just pushing this way and and trying to substitute with things that in uh investor companies of business from silicon valley from all around the world get used to so that's basically like a very brief general overview i won't take much time one more time, i mean more time thank you so that would be all yeah no, congratulations to all of us it's amazing the work you're doing i think it shows the dynamics and sometimes you only think about silicon valley or even london where i am but there's a massive diversity and as well dynamics going on so, Luisa, as uh, leading a global, uh, one of the biggest telecoms, and as well with a, with a, an audience of, of uh, 350 million plus people, and as well, Wire has been uh, one of the biggest accelerators for the last 10 years or more. So, has been um, Wire in general. So, you've been doing from Spain to Latin America. Here in the UK, you've been doing as well a, a very big work. And you've been, as always, from what I see, I, I was actually advisor for one of your, actually for one year, the last year with the UK. And one of the things I understood that you do mm -hmm. particularly interesting is that you bridge a lot of universities, corporations, and the government as well. So that's and big uh, corporations as well. So you have a huge network ecosystem, which is key for the governments and for the business, which is the panel purpose as well. So and I see that uh, everyone is trying to do this, and I see actually a lot of synergies between all of you. But uh, can you tell us a bit about this work? And I know that WireX is, is a new kind of dynamic that you're trying to push bigger, but you've been doing, I think it's interesting to see, because you've been, in terms of geolocation is amazing, because you've been from Spain, uh, UK that I mentioned, but Latin America and as well other countries around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. And you know, um, Telefonica is a Spanish company, but we also operate in in Europe and in Latin America. And in terms of you know startup ecosystem and you know everything, um, we we think that we need to be able to find great startups no matter where they are located you know so that's the reason why for us it's super important to build a super powerful ecosystem you know by 
engaging with different partners, you know, because as I said at the beginning, that's not uh, something that uh, we can do just by ourselves. We truly believe that we need to be open to, to new ideas, new ways of working, different ways of thinking, you know, different inputs to, to, to generate a, a powerful ecosystem and also to be able to, to create an, a relevant value proposition for Telefonica's customers and for the societies where we are operating. So as you, as you mentioned, we have uh, many different collaborations with universities to uh, be able to to stay close to students to start um, helping them to to generate new ideas uh, to um, challenge their plans. You know, because many times I remember, like uh, not not long time ago when I was at at the university. Everybody wants to go to a, a big corporation and, you know, having a good job. But now I'm really happy when I go to my university or when, when I'm having conversations with students that um, a lot of work from, from different partners and different institutions on a local, but also on a global level to, to, to give different tools to the to the entrepreneurs in each country to be able to develop their own ideas no completely so so um and i think it, it's quite interesting that a big corporation but as well working very close with the university sector with other partners both technology and governments so uh kimiko in, in vietnam you are working as well as as both the different heads that you have from uh, young entrepreneur so you're quite young as well so i think it's interesting to hear a bit of the dynamic startup ecosystem because we don't know much i think unless uh, you are in vietnam about what is happening in vietnam so a bit of that context um and as well how you doing these relationships because vietnam is quite technology savvy um and uh, it like you mentioned is a fast growing economy but they're very technology savvy but there's a lot of different things so a bit of this ecosystem if you could tell us a bit about that about how you see this from the different apps that you've been working uh, okay so before i share my perspective uh denise can we share like the quick video uh the, the three minutes video yeah, from so, the uh, so i will have yeah. So I can, I can talk more, like explaining uh, after that context okay, so video. Just yeah. give me a second. I was trying to put it on the end because it will probably disrupt a bit this. Can can you put it in the end? Because I don't, it will just uh, push in this will take us like two, three minutes and I don't want to keep the rhythm. Let's put it in the end if it's okay for you, Kimiko. You can't, uh, because it doesn't yeah, okay. stop the, the rhythm. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, for us, uh, I think it's very interesting uh, what we hear from Louisa and so on. And actually, interestingly, uh, this year in Vietnam, uh, because like I'm Ministry of Science and Technology, this year we have a new deputy, uh, the the new minister, and actually the the new minister of uh, Ministry of Science and Technology in Vietnam. Actually, he was like the ex head of like the biggest university in Vietnam. So this is a quite a big change, and also like uh, for the tech fest uh, after five years, this is the first time that we can gather like really the prime minister and the whole parliament to to go to this tech fest because usually it will be if the MOST is the host, uh, then they will um, invite different ministers from different uh, like uh, whoever is going to apply digital transformation into their daily operation. But this is the first year that we can invite uh, the prime minister. And the venue for this year is actually at the National Economics University. So this is a very, uh, I think, the the, the acceptance uh, and like the statement that we believe that the core root to the uh, thrivingness of the uh, staff ecosystem is in terms of like developing the next generation and uh, with the university R and D and and building like the next generation. Um, so in Vietnam, like the dynamics between startups and so on is. Uh, for the last four years is mostly heavily based on the investment wave so for example four years ago uh, there was a wave of investment into a food delivery app and uh, into um, e-commerce and then three years ago then we have um, like grab entering vietnam in terms of bright hailing so there was a, a wave of like rap hailing and then last year it was a wave of fintech in terms of e-wallet so every year there's a topic 
and this uh, is kind of like uh, it's the trend is driven more on like where the investment flow but i think like this year is more like based on the long term uh, ex um, observation and also in terms of the strategy that the government uh, for now we start to build an e portal for startup ecosystem where we map out the different stakeholders and for the startup we actually for um, for now we have around like 20,000 active startups in the country uh, but then like we start to map them out into like early stage and um, series a b c then like it's really structured the structure just got in like this year and our focus starting from now, because we come from a country of 100 million uh, population um, and like the e-commerce in here, actually for the last three years, it's grown like more than 300 percent. So you can see like the we have like a huge population. So that's a very good uh, uh, opportunity for data and for like shaping the new generation of customer behaviors. So basically for now, like the next trade for startups is more about like how we can uh, tap into those kind of customer insights into social commerce. So it's one step um, up from like the normal e-commerce, but then like the social commerce and how we can gain like the data insights and marketing automation. So that's the trend. And the next year trend, it will be more into like smart cities and IoT device infrastructure. Um, so basically, I think it, we can share a lot um, in terms of like developing countries uh, and Vietnam just, um, you know, uh, just passed this uh, middle income range uh, last year. So this is also a very critical time for us how to uh, strategize for the next five years to use digital strategy and um, innovation as a way to make us um, not fall into the trap of the middle income. We, we, we are not staying here forever, but we need to like aim for the sustainable and, and future. Yeah. Fantastic. So, uh, so Tina, I think there's a lot of parallels with the, with the Bangladesh economy. Um, and I think you have, like you mentioned before, a massive dynamic and entrepreneurial spirit. I think the number of, uh, I, I check different numbers, but the number of companies in, in Bangladesh is around 5 million or 10 million. I think the numbers go a bit, but it's quite amazing the number of SMEs, micro SMEs. So how do you see the, your work? And I know that, for instance, one of the things that both Vietnam, but especially as well Bangladesh, given that you have a massive population, is that you you manage very well COVID-19 and all the challenges related, and you have a very strong strategy in terms of accelerating during this time the work that you're doing, both with the Startup Bangladesh Limited Fund, but as well with all the ecosystem. So tell us a bit about that, because I think it's very important. Well, here in the UK, we didn't seem to manage it so well as you guys have been managing, and the UK is not even half of the population of you. So I think we have to learn as well. So sometimes the, the, the concept of emerging economies is very subjective. So I would like to hear from you. Thank you so much, Denise. I, I was listening to, um, you know, Kimiko, and it's really impressive. And I feel like that, you know, we are all in this peer group. So, you know, that's, that, that makes you very comfortable. So anyway, um, talking about, you know, what's happening in Bangladesh, what we did during COVID, um, I, you know, we talked about, you know, how the e-commerce and the, um, the ad techs and they have really exploded and uh, the market expanded. But, you know, looking forward, right? I mean, COVID is probably, COVID-19 19 will go away, but what it really brought, brought in and which is going to stay is that, you know, it has thrusted um, a kind of accelerated digitalization, right? So something that, you know, would have probably we would have done in 10 years, um, just pushed us half a decade, which is fantastic. So many of the lifestyle changes is going to say, stay probably, you know, like, you know, these Zoom calls. Um, I'm sure that there is going to be some uh, tail end of this, which is, you know, work from home, flexible work hours, things like that will will um, uh, will uh, want, need you know these uh, technological um, solutions but in um, but looking forward as a country and our ICT roadmap what we did is during the covid um, last seven eight months we took this very ambitious um, uh, project of uh, doing uh, coming with a covid 19 um, ICT roadmap which is basically um, looking at you know where where is our uh, where where are our weaknesses um, like you know obviously the crisis in public health and then also you know the um, the connectivity um, to provide all kinds of services 
um, you know, like many countries, uh, we also face the, those challenges, but we looked at it looked at it as an opportunity. So looking at those as an opportunities, you know, we are now focusing on agri-tech, edu-tech, um, um, and then also the, um, uh, the, the health tech, and also, you know, the frontier technology areas where we are going to, you know, uh, focus our technological development. But the first thing, first and foremost, is the universal access to digital devices, internet connectivity and affordability, and then also uh, digital literacy. So, you know, this is something that is going to be the motherboard where, where, you know, if this is taken care of, then all these different verticals that we are, you know, I just mentioned, the citizens can, you know, get connected to with a digital device and they, then they can get all these different type of services digitally, uh, especially the government services, 2,500 government services, you know, we want to make sure the citizens are uh, getting, you know, digitally. So, so this is creating a lot of, you know, um, um, opportunity for our startups, right? So digital commerce, um, we have the logistics startups, the agri-tech startups. Um, there is a big thrust on, you know, MSMEs because they are one of the largest employment generators. Um, in Bangladesh, they, um, they are, um, uh, they have about 87%, I think that's the number. Uh, but, you know, it's a large, large number uh, of employment that is being generated by MSMEs. Um, so, you know, also in that case, we need to have fintech, right? Because you want to make sure that these SMEs are um, accessing, you know, their, um, uh, the payment system is uh, digitally uh, done. And also um, not all of them uh, have a bank account. Um, uh, and then, you know, there is this um, credit rating. Uh, alternative credit rating. So, so you know, so all of this is basically going to create a huge trust in the startup ecosystem. And with that, uh, and with Startup Bangladesh Limited, and government has some other technological uh, plans. Um, like I mentioned, BHTPA. Um, there is also um, the economic special economic zone. Um, I think Alex um, uh, mentioned something like that, a special zone. Bangladesh actually has that, and that is. Um, uh, you know, the garments factory is a big uh, sector in, in using that zone. Um, so uh, what's going to happen is, you know, we are going to um, create not just a startup ecosystem, but, you know, the angel investors will come. The banks are going to create into venture capital funds, which is going to provide the funding. Um, so so the, the Startup Bangladesh Limited, this platform, these initiatives of the government, they're just a catalyst. Okay. And the ultimate goal is for the private industry to get engaged and really ignite the ecosystem. Um, so, you know, that's that's where we are right now. No, amazing. And I think it's uh, congratulations to all the work done. So I think what I see is that the dynamics are amazing. So, Alex, I know that uh, Ukraine with 43 million people is still a, quite a big population, has been really on the cutting edge of technology. And even with all the challenges, because like you mentioned, just came out of a war and you came out uh, of uh, a lot of things, but you have a very, very dynamic and a lot of uh, cooperation between uh, the economics. And like you mentioned, you the government is the biggest business angel, which is a great one. And I think congratulations for that. I think all governments should follow that. So one of the things I saw that you were very successful uh, is the relationship with big corporations that have actually uh, technology departments in the country. And as well, there's a lot of relationships on that. And I know that you've been as well creating a lot of policies to accelerate that. You mentioned different areas. I would like to hear about that work. Uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, uh, like relationship with the go you mean a relationship with government and business, right? Uh, yeah. In terms of yeah, uh, and as IT well with big corporations. Yeah. I know that big global corporations are having IT and tech departments over there in Ukraine. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, uh, like sixty, even more than sixty percent of the Ukrainian IT is just uh, that they, they are software outsourcing companies. So they, they most they basically work for uh, most of their fortune 500 companies in the world uh, uh, like a couple examples like um, a lot of stuff from buying Boeing uh, being done in Ukraine um, Deutsche Bank uh, operations uh, IT system is being built in Ukraine 
Uh, then uh, if you sit in, in any car in the world, like Mercedes, uh, Volkswagen, Audio, um, BMW, uh, all the computer uh, software is being built in Ukraine too. I mean, all the, all the, what you push on the screen is being built by Ukrainian engineers all in, in, in all these cars. Um, and, uh, and many, many more. I mean, the, the, there's so, uh, so many things. Um, um, and uh, uh, of course, we, uh, as, as a government, we, uh, we're trying to do our best in order to uh, make those uh, relationships uh, closer. But mostly, uh, you know, there's, there's a, th th this is about creating a uh, safer environment. Uh, and a uh, uh, couple, like, uh, what again, Tina mentioned, uh, um, very uh, transparent and easy uh, labor code because uh, they they just want to be flexible and uh, um, and people travel all the time. Well, before COVID, obviously, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and and they want to be like moving from one project to another very easy. And that that that's something that we're trying to come up with as a policies. Um, also, it's a matter of taxes. We I think we made. Um, uh, one of the lowest tax tax rate for for IT industry. It basically like um, like five percent plus uh, uh, some social expense around less than two percent. So basically, it's like seven percent on the labor taxes and very low corporate tax, um, which is very close. I mean, it's it's almost zero. So uh, so IT industry in in our country one of the top of priorities and 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 specifically for the president and 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 at the cabinet of minister. And, and we believe that we can grow it two times in, in just a couple of years, maybe two years, and involve like half half a million people, uh, highly experienced training engineers in Ukraine. Um, and um, uh, so that's um, that's their that's the, like a major goal that I'm in charge of basically. And another matter that I'm totally uh, on board with uh, Tina again that uh, COVID actually created a lot of um, opportunities because. Uh, like in Ukraine before COVID, everything was on a paper and and everything was offline. So and so once uh, COVID hits and we also going we implemented lockdown um, in, in, on the spring. So uh, our minister of digital transformation immediately started doing a lot of things and, and we had total support of Parliament. So we moved all the interaction uh, between um, government authorities online. That's the, that was the first step. Like. Uh, we, we started able to work completely online. Then we also um, uh, created a platform called Dia Business, which is basically um, uh, uh, a platform for business to interact between each other. And then uh, uh, called uh, Dia e Education, that's a platform for increasing digital literacy. And um, the ex that's, the, that's the funny thing, that expectations uh, for the, like, once we, 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 we made a plan like, uh, that would be really great if we can involve uh, at least like 50,000 people in a couple months after start. But when, once we release it, it was like uh, 120,000 people. And now in just half an year, this we uh, we uh, we actually tested and, and, and give uh, ed ed digital literacy courses to more than 300,000 people. And of course, there was involvement of business for that. And uh, we, uh, I don't know, there's like, um, there were a couple companies that volunteered at the first place, but then it, uh, they decided to give their services, of course, for money. So this, that, that, this, this opportunity created a demand for IT services. So um, another maybe small example, but this is also like before COVID, uh, if you were, uh, got fired and you, you, you want to get government support, you had to go to, um, uh, to the authorities sign forms and everything but now you just have an application so you put press the button and and and, and you're on the and you're on the list for the government support so so this is this is how and and, and, and it's actually being done by commercial i mean by, by the business with the help of the business so uh, there well uh, i haven't seen a changes coming so quickly for years and um I, I know that COVID is something that we're trying to really get rid of, and, and I totally support it. But for uh, for for uh, government and citizen interaction, that is, that gave gave us really huge uh, opportunity to to switch to move forward. And uh, maybe the last thing I want to let you know that 
um, uh, our president and, and uh, vice prime minister, my boss, uh, uh, he, he's also the minister of digital transformation. He, they announced a project to, in a year, go completely paperless. So in, uh, in one year from now, uh, well, actually next fall, so less than a year, uh, government won't be able to uh, request any paper from the citizen in Ukraine. So everything's go just paperless. So that's, uh, I think uh, maybe uh, I was trying to address your question, but I hope I did it. Thank you. Uh, you, you did it very well. Congratulations, first of all. I think uh, we need that in the UK, I think in the US and a lot of other countries, uh, because I think what you're doing is getting us. And I think uh, this experience is great. You can share it between you, but there's a lot of synergies. And it's really, I think special digital literacy is one of my fights um, because I think uh, we, have a, we have a challenge for us. I've been working with big governments and big corporations where people don't know how to use even a computer properly. So this is actually at all levels and it's really a big challenge. But for instance, yesterday we had a panel with some of the leading minds in AI. And that's probably my next question is that we are going very, very fast. So what you're doing is the way to go and this cutting edge, but that's not the other way. And I think if you look at the quote recently from Harari from the 20 lessons for 20th century is that we're going to have economies that will become data colonies of other economies if you're not strong on this. So it's a provocation, but I think this is critical. Um, so Luisa, being in a, one of the biggest global uh, conglomerates and corporations in technology, but as well in telecoms and as well being multinational. So you have in one end uh, the, the Latin America um, uh, experience that is emerging markets. Then you have Europe where you have UK and Spain, there are leading economies as well. So can you tell us a bit how you've been bridging both the technology sector as a company that is a technology provider and one of the biggest telecoms, but as well um, on the WireX where you're doing a lot of trends, you're working with some of the leading minds and, and as well personalities. So, and as well between the different economies, because one thing is UK, the other thing is Latin America where we are the biggest telecom pro provider. So a bit of that uh, overview, I think is interesting as well to bridge with everyone is doing and a bit of context about COVID-19. I think it affects everyone. I would like as well, how you are tackling that. Yeah, definitely. And you know, the good thing about being a multinational company is that we are able to generate synergies, you know, between countries, different organizations and areas inside inside of, of Telefonica. So the way we see it is that we 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 want to be able to generate wealth. Uh, not only for Telefonica, but also for the countries and the societies where we where we operate, you know, by uh, and technology has a fundamental role on it, you know, and we have seen it during during the lockdown, especially, you know, because everything was stopped, but technology was the tool that it allows everybody to continue operating, you know, to um, maintain factories open, kids going to school, um, everything. So I think it's it's clear how how technology is a key asset in any country, no matter where 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 you are located, either in in Europe, Asia. Um, Latin America connectivity it's, it's something that it's it's essential for for all of us and that's why also um, from from Telefonica um, you know we 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 see that um, we we have gone through many different challenges um, through COVID but we also think. Uh, this is a, a opportunity, you know, uh, to to inspire us to build a better future, uh, and that's why we have we have created a, a Telefonica, a, a digital a digital deal, you know, you know, to to build back our our communities, uh, our societies, our economies in in Europe and and in Latin America to define um, new roles, you know, uh, based on strong values and to, to be able to put people at the, at the center of the, of the equation to build a more sustainable, more sustainable societies. And 
to to put um, the focus also on on WireX. What we want to do is be able to invest on startups developing products that could become massive. So products that could be used at the same time in Vietnam, Spain, Rio, Rio, you know, any anywhere in the world. And we are putting our focus especially in, in those areas that were reinforced due to COVID. So anything related to education, environment, um, reducing the digital gap between uh, societies, but also between generations, you know, something that we have seen during this pandemic is how elderly people start to um, get more and more engaged with, with technology and start embracing it. So we think that there is a, a great opportunity for, for all of us. And we want to be able to, to discover those companies developing innovative solutions, uh, no matter where they are located. So from our side, we will be ready to, to help all those entrepreneurs to scale up their businesses. Oh, congratulations. And I think it's very inspiring as well that it's coming from a private owned company, a conglomerate, because I think we need that bridge as well. So um, Kimiko, in Vietnam, one of the things I've been finding out is really the dynamic of the young population and as well the, this bridge between all the different players of society. There's a bit of a, a sense of com community that is very present and a very strong dynamic and velocity. So uh, like you mentioned, it's a big economy, but as well, um, a very dynamic. So um, I know that Vietnam has been coping as well, very well with COVID. I think you, you are much better than actually as in Europe. So um, can you tell us a bit about that dynamic and as well some of the work that uh, both the government and the, and the startup ecosystem and as well the business are doing as well some of your experiences? Yeah, thank you. So um, I think I have like three key points to share about the overview of what's happening in Vietnam right now. So the first of all is actually we are officially back to the old normal, uh, which like uh, only um, social case of COVID is actually contained and uh, everyone is back into the normal previous life and we host that like public event so the the tech fest that Nines was the honorary speaker we also hosted it like the offline event was 2000 or 3000 people so um, so the, the government has been doing a really good job in, ter in terms of like you know containing uh, the pandemic but of course like the second point is that everywhere is so heavily um, affected by the COVID because uh, our GDP mostly come from the export and also like for the outsourcing and the manufacturing and when the supply chain of the world is like really changing then of course we see a lot of um, crisis happening for the startups and even though we have some kind of subsidy for like the operation and so on, we see the dropout rates for the staffs, especially like the one in the early stage or like pre-series A. Um, so the dropout stage for the staff like is at the recording high rates. And um, uh, I, I see that as both like the challenge and also like the opportunities because after this, we really see who is like the staff who has the very good uh, preparation in terms of uh, because we have a joke in the staff world that you always have to reserve at least um, 12 months of your operation cost uh, no matter what happens like maybe you you have some investment money coming but the cash flow is very important that you, you reserve some kind of cash and uh, for the last um, six months i think that we see a high record of uh, bankruptcy not only in startups but like in very big uh, industry players, uh, companies and enterprises that have like a lifelong maybe 10 or 20 years success in the market but like the cash flow is a huge problem and our tourism is hugely affected so yeah for, for like this is a very critical um, time for the country but the third notion that I want to mention is I, I usually compare like this to World War II like the, the common thing between like this pandemic time and the World War II is that uh, usually after the pandemic or after the World War II, uh, what you, uh, of course, like um, uh, admi uh, admit the high debt rate and like the economic um, downturn. But actually, usually after the downturn, it's always like a huge time 
for opportunities, golden time for something booming coming. So right 10 years after World War III is actually like the accelerating part. Uh, the world has seen an enormous um, inventions and most of like the application for new things. So I think for, for this pandemic, it really put us into a new perspective and really pushes forward, um, motivate us to push, be pushed forward. And there was a, um, a survey from McKinsey. They say that the acceleration rate for digital transformation caused by COVID is seven to 10 years in developing countries and five to seven years in developed country. So almost everywhere now in the country, we see the option to either purchase the thing offline or it will be um, online. And there's some kind of like e-learning, e-something like e-competition and everything is like work from home. So I see that it's a, a huge opportunity. And that's why like um, for the Ministry of Science and Technology in Vietnam, we firstly like we open like the National Innovation uh, Center and also like we draw in um, the fund uh, actually that like, reserve um, some fund from the government and we we push forward at like the biggest co-working space in the country in two uh, in the two major cities in Vietnam to uh, try to like to support the ecosystem. Oh, fantastic! And I think this is a I think you touch a very important thing is that definitely um, COVID has been a, a weapon of uh, financial and economical disruption and in some cases destruction. Um, there's a lot of things I think still, well, if you compare the, the pandemic of 1920, uh, the Spanish flu with the pandemic now, well, of course, the number of deaths is much smaller. And we have to see that in for instance, 1920, there was around 1.5 billion people in the planet. Now there's eight. So we achieved quite a big achievement and we need to look at the positive part of that. But of course, the economical downturn is massive and there's other technological so one of the things and, and tina i want to um i know that you come from silicon valley where you work with the, one of the biggest uh, um, companies in the planet as well and you work a lot with the the startup ecosystem of silicon valley in san francisco now you are in bangladesh so i see that uh, these countries i think all your countries uh, are right now countries that actually can go faster than actually most of the established global economy powerhouses because you have not so much um red tape so much bureaucracy and as well a lot of uh, um past weight and as well as a much younger population so i know that in in bangladesh you've been coping very well with covid 19 as well i know that you focus on uh implementing the sdg um uh, goals from united nations and i know as well that you are trying to create the that is a very uh, entrepreneurial economy trying to create the startup uh, dna in the economy so can you tell us a bit about these different things um sure denise thank you so much uh, you know uh, like you said that you know bangladesh actually handled the covid situation and still managing it uh, pretty well and surprisingly well um, although there has been a lot of crisis in the public health sector, but you know, uh, it's not as bad as many of the developed countries. Um, so hopefully, you know, we will continue to do that way. Um, I wanted to uh, just um, mention one thing that's going on, talking about COVID and events. Um, currently, right now, as we speak, we actually have the largest um, virtual online um, event that's going on in Bangladesh, which is known as the digi Digital World. And Denise, I told you about this um, a few days ago. Uh, so Digital World 2020 started December 9th and is going to conclude on December 11th. It is the largest IT um, fair in the country hosted by the ICT ministry. And, you know, anything about ICT startups, you know, it's there and it's global. So we have, you know, uh, ministerial conferences and uh, representatives from uh, global companies and whatnot. So I would, I would, um, uh, you know, encourage any one of you and whoever the, the listeners and the audience to kind of check it out. Um, uh, so going back to your question about, um, you know, what uh, what we are doing, right, um, uh, with startups and whatnot and COVID. So a couple of things I'm going to specifically mention about our post-COVID roadmap. And the big, uh, big things uh, that we are working on, especially to help the startups. One is, you know, that we are looking into developing a national policy and agenda for startups. So, so that, you know, we can incentivize the angel investors with uh, taxes and different type of, you know, um, financial incentives. 
Um, also, we are looking into you know working with regulators, um, uh, especially on the fintech area, because anything that's related to fintech, you know, uh, regulation regulators are involved, especially the central bank and whatnot. So we are looking into you know working with regulators to make sure that you know it is the regulations and whatnot is a startup friendly. If, if there are no regulations, we are going to make policies and uh, policies which is going to be helpful. Um, also on the structurings, uh, the type of real, uh, legal structures that is going to be more um, startup friendly. Um, and then, you know, trying to um, also have, we have a very favorable, you know, back tax, um, capital re uh, uh, repatriation policies for, you know, foreign investments. Um, so, and the other thing is, you know, there is a huge thrust in access to digital financial services. So on that, you know, I want to um, mention the, our uh, flagship project that is happening with ICT Ministry in partnership with our central bank, which is the interoperable digital payment transaction platform. So, you know, in many cases, Bangladesh, which is entering a middle income country status, you know, it is not using like, uh, you know, it's not like going from um, like graduating from, you know, primary school to middle school. It's actually graduating from primary school to secondary school. It's leapfrogging with technology. And that is what's happening with the digital financial services and with this interoperable um, the digital transaction platform, uh, IDTP, uh, an aggregator platform where all the vendors, banks, um, you know, MFSs, they will be onboarded and there can be interoperability between all of these platforms, which will create, this is going to be a transformational um, uh, impact uh, through the nation because you know, if you think about it, the unbanks uh, can use their MFS account and send money from one end MFS account to you know the other MFS accounts. Probably sending their you know um, uh, the monthly allowances uh, to their families who are back in the rural areas. Uh, so you know, like uh, the millions of you know the informal workers, the garment workers, um, uh, all of them. You know, they have access to these services. And the SMEs, is, it's going to also, for the SMEs, it's going to create their credit ratings, the credit history. Um, the other thing is, you know, ease of doing business is a big um, agenda in Bangladesh's, uh, you know, and their plan in our ICT roadmap also. Uh, and then, you know, the lastly is the investment in education and the collaboration with academia um, uh, so that, you know, the research and development can happen with the universities and whatnot. Um, the big agenda, uh, all of this, you know, is uh, what uh, all of this is going to be um, um, kind of, there's an overarching uh, agenda, which is made in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh wants to be the startup and the tech hub, the manufacturing hub um, in the next 10 years. Um, and, you know, that is our made in Bangladesh campaign, um, which is basically is going to boost the ICT and emerging technologies um, uh, in the country. Um, so, you know, I would stop there. Uh, hopefully, I was able to answer uh, part of your questions, Denise. But I wanted to, you know, kind of, um, you know, mention these points. The other thing is very quickly, you know, this year we are uh, celebrating the birth centennial of the father of our nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and it is indeed um, an honor for for Startup Bangladesh Limited to start its journey, a pioneering journey in this year. And next year, 2021, we are going to celebrate the country's 50th birth anniversary as a sovereign nation. So, you know, it's a very exciting time that we are passing right now. Congratulations, and I think it's an excellent work. So, Alex, I'll leave you the last word. You were the last one, so you have the last word as well. But uh, I think, uh, so it's been amazing, and I think there's a lot of uh, interesting notes that I have here. And the, I can, congratulations to all your work. I think Kimiko had to left to leave us. I think she had some some personal uh, issues. But I think so, Alex. In terms of Ukraine, and you mentioned fantastic case studies. We actually, I think you need to promote it more worldwide because I think you you guys have been in the news for the wrong reasons, and you have actually a fantastic work that deserves much more attention. Um, so um, and I know that I know that because I've been working with the Ukrainian startups, and I know the dynamism and the technology capacity that you have. So. As a wrap up and as well contextualizing what Tina and Luisa mentioned, um, any notes that you want to talk and I think especially some case studies um, that you've been mentioned, but as well concrete things. You mentioned some unicorns that were coming out, out of Ukraine. 
you mentioned as well the work with the government policy making so but other things you're doing and i think especially the digital literacy which is critical for any country but i would like probably and i know that you are a technologist as well so i know that you're very cutting edge in terms of ai and ai is a massive uh, can be used for good or for bad and at the moment has been mostly used actually for bad in a lot of ways so um in terms of governmental work in terms of these areas of technology and ai which is the most challenging uh topic of our time but as well the most challenging topic of technology of of economy because the governments that will tackle this right will be the ones as well that will create new jobs and create a lot of new solutions so i don't know if you want to wrap up on that and i think it's it's great as well to to wrap up with that note uh, you are on mood uh alex if you in mind yeah no worries <laughs> yeah i'm back sorry so uh in terms of ai um and, um Actually, like last week, uh, yeah, it was just last week. Uh, government, uh, our government approved and uh, voted for concept of development of AI, AI in Ukraine on a government level. So it basically covers uh, um, education, defense, uh, business, and some other parts, like two other um, uh, I don't know sectors uh, directions, and. Uh, and since we are um, kind of in a war state with Russia and those uh, Eastern, so this is very important for our Minister of Defense. They they had huge plans. They have huge plans on on using AI for different purposes, and they coming up. They came up with the really cool things, and and um, the, they focus on uh, 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 non-human uh, managed uh, war um, warfare. So that's maybe a bad thing, <laughs> as you mentioned. Uh, but uh, for uh, of the, on the good on the on the good side, uh, so uh, for example, like another case for uh, where AI is used, uh, and also with the with the, with their relationship with the government, um, there are so due to COVID, there was a huge uh, spike on unemployment rate. So uh, together with the AI company, one of the AI companies in Ukraine, we came up with a solution that basically tests uh, unemployment if they have enough skill to become IT engineers or at least to be educated in IT sphere. So, uh, so they built a solution that you basically interact with the, with the machine and it asks you different questions and it's not linear, non-linear. And then it figure out what's your level of preparedness to uh, to the IT, so can it be or uh, can it have a potential to become an engineer or Q, uh, quality assurance manager or uh, maybe project manager or maybe delivery manager or you 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 be a programmer? So that's that's the example of what where we implemented AI in uh, and, and, and actually at the moment. So it, it the platform works now. So another thing that uh, we started to. Um, Kind of, it's it's just starting because we recently um, I mean, we implemented those cameras on the road and uh, and, and on the streets. So um, a face recognition that's that's another thing. It's very common and uh, we're moving towards because it's it, and it's it's about security and safety on the streets and because it, it allows many do many things. So um, so that are, so definitely we look uh, towards this and 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 I mentioned before in my uh, during my presentation that reface AI, which is basically AI technology on, on uh, face recognition is uh, is built by Ukrainians and uh, and hit their tops on, on, on uh, with the hundred million of downloads. So so that's that's the focus for us. And and, and this is what sa- we, what we said as a government, like, look, if you do something in AI, we can give it totally government support. We can give you a, I know, uh, area of implementation. So just just do it and come to us. Um, so that that's that's how we talk to this. Thank you. Oh, I thank you. It's been a fantastic panel. Even I think uh, it passed my personal expectations that they were big. So I I really appreciate. First of all, congratulations to all the work you've been doing. Which is I know that is not easy because it's very easy to criticize. What is difficult is to create. And especially the ones of you working with governments, which is the most important thing, because in the last years there have been kind of a, a trend very negative towards governments, but the governments are still the, the core of our economies. And we need governments to, to make us be citizens and to make us create the rules and, and as well to improve and empower us. So I want to thank you all. I think uh, 
Tina from Bangladesh. Um, I think you've been uh, amazing what you're doing. Congratulations for festival. We're going to put links as well during our, our uh, summit as well. Uh, Louisa, congratulations with WireX. I hope we can continue collaborating and I will connect you all. But I think it's amazing what you're doing and as well the cutting edge solutions that you've been putting together. And Alex, congratulations and as well, Thanks. fantastic work you've been doing over there. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So now we, we're going to just pass the video, as we promised, from the, the Deputy Minister of, uh, um, um, of uh, 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 Vietnam. So it's a small video about the Tech Fest and the small testimony that he did uh, in the context of the Vietnamese system and what they've been doing there. So I'll put there is the last four minutes. Uh, thank you, everyone watching. I think we kept around the between 1,000 people to 2,000 people on the live. So I thank you all from all over the world. And I'll just share this last video. And then we have a session in actually around four minutes. So I'll just uh, share the screen and I'll put the video. And I hope this time the sound will work well. So just a second. I need to make sure that I take my headphones.
we're going to be starting the new panel. Serafim, I pass the word to you. Thank you. You are on mute as well. Hello, thank you, Genius. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for a great panel. And now we are moving to our next uh, panel, how can frontier tech, blockchain, AI, IoT, FinTech can change our government, cities, and societies. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. Thank you. <laughs>